Hey gamers, it is ad break time. First, I'm going to include a quick ad for myself. I recently started a Patreon, so if you love this podcast and want to give me some added support, I would be so grateful. You can find me at patreon.com slash beyond solitaire. Second, this podcast is very proudly sponsored by Central Michigan University's Center for Learning Through Games and Simulations, and they have some awesome stuff coming up this season. Rising Waters, designed by Professor Scout Bloom, is a historical game that will hit Kickstarter this fall, so stay tuned for a preview on my YouTube channel that is coming soon. Second, CEU is continuing to offer some really exciting game design classes that are co-sponsored by Gen Con. Check out the site linked in the show notes to check out amazing upcoming classes taught by Damon Stone and Lamar Smith. If you stay tuned a bit longer, you might even be able to take a class from yours truly in 2023. And all these classes can contribute to a certificate and apply to game design from Central Michigan University. So that sounds awesome to me. Thank you so much for listening and let's get on with the show. Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and this week I have a very special guest. This is Brett Devereaux. He is a researcher at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and he's also the author of a very cool blog called A Collection of Unmitigated Pedantry. How are you doing today, Brett? I'm doing all right. Thanks for having me, Liz. Yeah, it's great to be on here. So actually, um, I reached out to you because you were interviewed in a really interesting piece for The Atlantic about Europa Universalis. So this is mostly a board game um podcast but europa universalis is a video game could you give us just like a rundown of what it is and how it started to appear in your classroom yeah so so europa universalis or i'm gonna just say eu4 for short um or we'll be here all week um is a is a computer game amusingly it was a board game that became a computer game that has now become a board game again um but the computer game is the main structure um, of it, it's been through four iterations, although really only um, EU three and four have been particularly popular. Um, and it is an early modern global grand strategy game. The player plays as an early modern state starting in 1440. You play to the 1830s um, and you direct the state. Um, it's economic military and diplomatic strategy through that period the game has no defined win state you can set your objectives as you want although mechanics tend to push you towards conquest and expansion um it is despite the title notionally global you can play any state um which is actually really remarkable in in the computer game space where generally only a handful of states are usually playable um, this means you don't have to play as a European state. If you want to play as the Ming Dynasty, if you want to play as um, the West African state of um, Sokoto, you can. Um, some of those are actually really interesting games, um, though they'll be really different. Though I would say that in its conception, there the, the game is, is to a degree Europe-focused. It's become less so over time. Um, and just a general warning for people who are unfamiliar with this game. Um, one thing that is uh, true about it is that um, it has been is released years and years ago, and it has half a decade or more of DLC and expansions. Um, I would say wait for a Steam sale. I don't know. Um, it's buying all of it is expensive. You don't need to, and there are various guides online as to sort of what are the essential DLCs. Uh, this sounds awesome. You four. So what's interesting about this is that um, apparently e- EU is so popular that students are coming into university level history classes with an idea of world history and how it works and like what has happened in the scope of human history based on their experience with this game. Would you say that that's an accurate assessment? I have had that happen. Yeah. And I've heard that from other from other professors as well. What actually triggered the blog series, which resulted in the Atlantic article, was another um, professor, a political scientist, um, who was not familiar with the game, commenting on Twitter. And he, he had an early modern politics survey. Um, and he's like, I have students who are coming in. This is their experience. I've never played or interacted with this is there anything about it that can give me a sort of basis? And uh, I kind of looked around at what people were were sending him. And the answer was basically, no, there wasn't. No one had kind of done a deep dive of it. 
And so I decided to, in particular, because I think it's important, games express meaning. And you're talking about board games. Obviously, this has come up before. Express meaning in different ways than, than narratives do. And so they require different analytical techniques because mechanics can bring meaning on their own in a way that may not be narratively present. And so I did a series sort of breaking out. Here are the sort of the theory of history presented by the mechanics of, of this game. Um, a, a lot of people read it. It got featured in the Atlantic. I actually have had some chats with the devs, um, which is a little wild. Uh, but apparently it got read over at Paradox. Um, they liked it. Uh, not everything I say about it is positive, but they're pretty open to criticism, which is nice. Um, but yeah, and um, and certainly gaming in general, and particularly the expanding computer gaming space, but also tabletop war gaming, um, this informs what students bring with them into the classroom. It, it and and I think in part because we academics tend to be old fuddy duddies. Um, you know, my generation is sort of the first generation to sort of come through as gamers from from the beginning. There's a lack of awareness that how to put this: older academics are prepared to understand the way a movie like Gladiator will shape their students' understanding of Roman history. They are not prepared to understand how Rome total war is going to shape their students' understanding of history, or indeed Europa Universalis, um, which is really right now in the computer strategy space, I think the unquestioned king of early modern Europe. So that was a very long and rambling explanation of how I came to the topic. I like longer rambling. It works for me. All right. So um, I guess just, you know, we can't talk about every aspect of this game, especially with all the DLC and the years of existence. But I wanted to talk to you specifically because I think it's really interesting to talk about how games can create or kind of um, just build in historical presuppositions, but without necessarily having to prove up like it can just be part of the game and it can be part of a system that you accept so in something like europa universalis what are some assumptions about that game that then play into someone's interpretation of history if they have played a lot of it and take it seriously yeah so let's let's do two examples um a sort of a, a better example and then a, a less fortunate example so um one of the better examples um is the way that diplomacy and warfare and international relations in Europe Universalis work. Um, you know, your ability to, to raise armies to defend yourself in Europe Universalis is mostly, it's a function of your underlying economic layer. I'm going to simplify. There are a lot of resources, the money and manpower and so on and so forth. But in practice, the way the game is structured Wars are decided by how many guys you can get into uniform. This isn't like a total war game where you can win battles repeatedly against impossible odds. If your armies are small and dinky, you will just lose. Um, so you need to get resources to get an army to be safe. Um, in order to do that, you need to expand your economic base. And consistently in the game, the cheapest way to expand your economic base is to expand, to take land and territory from somebody else. Um, the result is therefore, to be safe, you must expand into other people's territory. So to for you to be safe, you must make them less safe. Um, and so each state is then pushed by this logic to expand at the expense of their weaker neighbors in order to seek safety from their stronger neighbors. And that logic actually produces a line of behaviors that is historically recognizable. Um, it's what the political scientists would call a system of interstate anarchy. Um, and we see in the game, it produces the behaviors we would expect from that kind of a system. Large states gobble up small states in their um, in their competition. Um, states compete to the degree that they militarize, and war is normalized in the system. Um, everybody is playing the empire game, and the question is just who wins and who loses. Um, and there's a sort of brutal arithmetic to all of this. And as a simulation of early modern European politics, or indeed early modern global politics, 
yeah, that's how it works. Interstate anarchy is rough. Um, and so the game's base assumptions about the way that resources are distributed, how you acquire them, and how you convert those into military forces drives the player along a chain of logic where the otherwise perhaps ineffable reasoning of historical actors like, why did France just go to war all the time? Why was France always going to war in the 1500s and 1600s and 1700s? The game leads you through the chain of logic that gets you to why France is doing that and indeed why everyone is doing that. Um, that has some downstream implications for how you understand their actions. Um, but it roughly corresponds to um, at least, not the only, but at least a theory of what's happening in state interaction. The player has uh, learned something. Um, I'd say the negative example um, would be uh, how the game explains the sort of almost central historical fact of this period, um, which is the emergence of, of a European-dominated world order. Um, and the way the game essentially creates this, there is a technology system. You advance in technology over time. Your rate of advancement um, is determined by the number of what the game calls institutions that your country has. And essentially, the game logic has been slanted in the back end to make sure that those institutions emerge in Europe. And those institutions are things like the printing press or global trade. Um, one thing that's frustrating is that some of these institutions either did not only emerge in Europe or did not first emerge in Europe. Um, the emergence of the printing press in Europe was really important, but printing was happening in China earlier. Global trade was not new in this era, although it was intensifying. Um, so some of these institutions emerging in Europe, and you're like, wait, shouldn't this already be in other parts of the world? Um, and it creates a sort of weird forcing of the system to produce this outcome um, that doesn't really engage with the, in fact, pretty vibrant academic debate about, as I phrase it in the, in the series, and folks can read the series if they want the long version, why Europe? Um, which is sort of is in fact a, a very debated question about is it geography? Is it the ways that gunpowder developed? Is it the fragmentation of European states? Is it that European states were uniquely driven by competition? Is it an impact of colonialism? Is it, you know, um, and the game doesn't really effectively engage with, with those answers. It has this very gamey system um, that I think might lead a player to assume that um, you know, why Europe? Well, it's because the Europeans were really clever and came up with the printing press. Mm, no. So have, um, so have students come into your class having to unlearn things that they had previously learned from video games? Like, have we gotten to that point in terms of intellectual development of history students? Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Although I will say that the, the Total War franchise is more often the culprit here. Um, that students have assumptions about how ancient battles and armies worked that are not necessarily based on how ancient battles and armies worked. They're based on how they work in, in total war games. Um, but no, and you, and you do come with students. It's sometimes hard to know where they have it, but they have a sort of a, an understanding and a model of, for instance, of this why Europe question um, that is either very much oriented towards a, a European exceptionalist answer in the sense of, well, it's because the Europeans were just very clever and came up with all of these ideas without engaging in a lot of the larger questions involved. Or it's a different version of European exceptionalism. The Europeans were simply uniquely evil and engaging in imperialism, and no one else was. Um Neither of which is, I think, a really accurate engagement with the question. Um, that is, it's it's much more complex, um, and so you do have you do have these sort of imported assumptions, um, which can be a little awkward. I think if you crack into it a little bit further, and if you get into the kind of the substratum, there's also not necessarily an assumption, but a viewpoint that a lot of these games encourage. You rarely play as a character in these games. You play as a state. 
often in some of these games, you play as a state before the invention of a state. Civilization is like the worst offender here. You play as the French in 4000 BC. And I'm like, wait a minute. How do the French have a unified culture? They don't even have writing yet. Um, but they have a sense of themselves as a nation. Um, that's not how that works. Um, ask people in Provence the degree to which they're French, and you'll get some exciting answers today, much less in the 1800s. Um, likewise, ask some Italians if Sicilians are really Italians. Um, you know, but but in civilization, the Sicilians believe they're Italians in 4000 BC. Uh, which would have been news to the Romans in 100 BC. Um, and so that perspective, and that runs through something like EU4. In EU4, you don't play as the king. Kings come and go. You play as the state in all of its majesty. You are France as a thing. Whatever territory France happens to control, that's you. And it encourages players and thus students, to think about it from that perspective. Things that are good for the state are good. Things that are bad for the state are bad. You have to stop them and it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, so, you know, Louis XIV wages all these wars. He wins eh, most of them. He takes new territory. It is good, in theory, for France. Was it good for Frenchmen? Um, because the answer to that question is no. Um, they put tremendous strains on the economy and the budget and laid the groundwork for the revolution. Um, the French one. Um, to be clear, um, right, that was that was bad. I mean, you can ask the sort of similar questions like this kind of empire building. It's good for the state. Is it good for the people? Um, and of course, you have to ask, for which people? Um Paradox games are a little bit better at this than most, but they still often fail to, for instance, direct the player's attention to the real human costs of what they're doing. When you wage wars in EU4, your little army comes into contact with their little army, and then you see little red floaty numbers coming above it, which are the number of casualties you're sustaining. And that's it. That's the sense you have of the potentially hundreds of thousands of people that are you know, dying for your flights of vainglory. Um, and again, you have the whole apparatus of interstate anarchy to sort of press you into those decisions. But at least within EU4, the game never stops and then kind of asks you, well, is that a good idea? Um, it, it encourages what um, I, I've come to refer to as the sort of risk view of the world. Um, disembodied states competing for territory um, rather than... The state is a fiction. It is composed of people. It is composed of individuals. It is composed of, of you know, your ruling class and, and everybody else. And they all collectively make up the state. And all of them have degrees of power and influence in the system. And all of them are have different and maybe even competing interests, right? The state is not unitary. Um, but these games often encourage this sort of, like I said, risk-like thinking about the state as unitary. And of course, like the the sort of risk thinking of if I lose six armies, but I get Kamchaka, I'm ahead. That's good. And it's like, yeah, unless you were in one of those five armies, then you're dead and somebody else has this territory. Maybe that's not great for you. Uh, briefly, I will say, and, and this is part of why I treated them both more or less together on the blog, in some ways... The Victoria series, which takes place chronologically immediately after Europa Universalis by the same de developer, is almost a response to this problem. And I think it's kind of a brilliant response. Um, it redirects the player's attention to the impacts on people. It's also wildly less popular. Maybe that will change. Victoria 3 is coming out soon. Um, but it is it is much less popular than EU4. Um, you know, managing factories is, I guess, a little more boring than world conquest. So you wrote some about this, but this all leads to the question, um, especially because with the good and the bad, this this game has so many historical kind of 
assumptions built in. Um, one of the reasons you chose to focus on Europa Universalis in particular is that you felt it had something to say and that its history is to a greater degree deliberate. Um, do you think that that is also a contributing factor to making it more impactful on students? Or can you just play any old history game and get random ideas about history from them? You can certainly get random ideas from any old history game if you want. Um, I think consumers, there is, I think if you look at, at what people are playing, there is an attentiveness to what players perceive as historical accuracy. I think the problem that that runs into when you look at, at, at the games out there is that obviously the players don't have PhDs in history and are not prepared to assess historical accuracy, they look for indicators. Um, and those indicators become marketing tools. Now, if you look at a paradox game, the indicator that a paradox game gives you is honestly its world map. When you open up a paradox game, the first thing you are greeted with is its world map. And like, here it is. And we have put, they have put every single state on the map down to tiny one province miners. 50-odd tiny German principalities, there they are, carefully, everyone exactly where it should go. That level of detail is paradox signaling to the player, we have put some thought into this. And that's great, because they actually have put some thought into this. But you can do that and not put any thought into it. Um, and I've critiqued games on, on, on this. Um, I had a, actually an extended review um of um expeditions rome um which actually got picked up by foreign policy which was kind of hilarious um for exactly this sort of a sort of thing that the game presented itself as as sort of with all the trappings of actually there's a lot of attention to the arms and armor a lot of untranslated latin words in the dialogue although in some cases um they weren't picking the right words um, <laughs> well, I mean, they kept referring to their soldiers as legionarii, and I'm like, we're in the first century BC. No one, it's it's militates. No one, legionarius is an adjective. It's not used substantively this way. Caesar does not talk this way. This is the wrong word. Um, like the most nitpicky of nitpicks, but it grated on my ears that I'm like, I have read too much Livy and Caesar. That's not, this is not how they would use that word. Um, but all of that Latin... Um, and they, they brought in a, a Latin philologist to nail the pronunciation, and almost entirely they did. Uh, classical pronunciation, well done. Um, you know, it gives the player a real sense that, like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get some some con some Roman content. There's gonna be some real stuff. And then, in terms of the geopolitics and the internal politics of the Roman Republic, it's a mess. And so you you can run into this situation where the the player does not have the means to assess the actual accuracy. They're going to see all the indicators because the indicators are good for marketing. Um, uh, you know, I, I've also um, um, critiqued the recent Age of Empires um, that there was a real effort, a real marketing push for Age of Empires four to sort of stress its historical rootedness but not to revise any of the game mechanics in a way that would make them more historically meaningful. It's, it's the same Age of Empires it's always been, um, which is fine. I enjoy Age of Empires okay, but like if all you've added are you know some cutscenes with some, some basic historical details, but you haven't added anything else, you've only added the appearance of historical accuracy. You've only added verisimilitude. You haven't added any actual veritas. Um, no, no actual truth, and so, so I think, I think in part this then creates a sort of a need for a critical approach to some of these games that is historically informed, because Lord knows, right, the gaming press is not prepared to do that. Um, review after review praised Expeditions Rome for its historical accuracy. As I am sort of banging my head on the table, I think the. The winner is in 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 Act Three, 
Um, there's a meeting of the Senate where I think in 12 lines of dialogue, they do 12 things you cannot do in a meeting of the Senate. I'm like, that's impressive. We're just breaking rules all over the place. We're proposing a dictator in the wrong way, in the wrong format, by the wrong person who's picked the only human being on the planet Earth he cannot nominate, um, which is an impressive feat um, because you can nominate anyone, literally anyone to be dictator, except yourself. Um, And just, I was like, I was like, wow. Like, this is a heck of a scene. Like, this process is just entirely wrong, top to bottom. Um, but it's it's presented with all these lovely Latin words. Um, and I'm like, great, I'm going to have to, you know, in, in my Rome survey, I'm going to be deprogramming kids from, like, this scene. I mean, probably not, because this was a small, like, it was a small indie game. And I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to rag on Expeditions Rome too much. Like, it's, it's fine. Just don't take the history seriously. Um, but, but there's that disconnect with how games signal how seriously you should take their history versus how seriously you should take their history, and and I think that that creates a, a need for historians to engage critically, um, in the public space, um, you know, as part of our kind of public history mission, um, in order to kind of provide that that critique. I actually really agree with that. I think that one of the biggest arguments that appears in board games, you know, it just kind of flares up on Twitter every so often, right? It's like, oh, it's just a game. You know, the theme is there because it's fun and it makes the game fun. And, you know, you might have a really nice Euro game with like a really good map and some, yeah, like maybe it's a Roman theme and you've got some Latin words, but there are also some things that the game assumes historically that are wrong. And like this pops up in, in arguments about games that have sort of colonial perspectives. Yes. And yeah, I mean like what is the obligation of a publisher to match their historical signaling of we're legitimate with like actually legitimate viewpoints. And then, yeah, what is the responsibility of people who are in a position to comment historically um, to step in, especially when something's really wrong as opposed to like wrong, but fun. Yeah. So, I mean, I think I tend to, um, I tend to, in my critiques, um, I think you can have a game that has errors that are for the most part inconsequential. Um, Expeditions Rome is going to give you a really skewed vision of a vision of Roman history. Uh, and I'm a little frustrated by its marketing. Um, if the accuracy marketing wasn't there, I would not have much of a problem with it. On the flip side, um, I got some blowback from Ubisoft um, when I called Assassin's Creed Valhalla a profoundly irresponsible game, um, and I, I think so. Um, you know, there was a game that like they wanted to play with um, the Viking conquest of England, um, which is obviously an issue freighted with questions about colonialism and settlement and these sorts of things. And I, I I think I demonstrated they didn't really engage with those themes responsibly at all. It's like here's your here is your religiously tinged colonialism theme park. Um, everybody's white, so you don't have to feel bad. So have fun being the the colonizer. And I'm like, that's mm, no. Um, you know, there is there is some responsibility that attaches to the subject matter. And certainly in the board game space, there are oh too many examples of count where it's like, have fun colonizing Africa. And it's like, wait a minute, though. Historically speaking, this was a deeply unpleasant set of issues. Couldn't couldn't these mechanics be put somewhere else? In a lot of cases, I go those games like, couldn't couldn't these mechanics be something something else? Um, couldn't like could we be colonizing Mars? And still use these mechanics. Um, And often, like, the answer is yes. Um, So I think when the designer chooses the historical subject matter, some responsibility attaches to to attempt to deliver it, not necessarily accurately, but responsibly. And part of that responsibility that I think attaches also has to do with how you then market 
the end product. Um, if you market the end product as silly and generally not rooted in, in history, the responsibility is not zeroed, but it is lessened. Um, though I think that anytime you are dealing with colonialism, imperialism, genocide, racism, so on, right, the responsibility is high. Those are charged issues. Um, and you need to you need to be careful about them. I'm not saying you can't touch them, but you need to be careful about them. Um, for historians, uh, I mean, you know, I am banging my spoon on my high chair about this continuously. That I think that academic historians need to be more engaged in in the public space um, and a little less retreated into our silos. And and I think the gaming space is a, is one of those examples. It is wild to me how many historical gaming franchises just don't have much in the way of haven't attracted much scholarly attention at all. Um, I will say that it's somewhat better in the ancient world because classics has the strain of reception studies. So the moment you say that Kratos and God of War is a Spartan, um, you have classicists writing articles on Medium or whatever about you know how this is the reception of, of Sparta. Uh, by the way, Sparta sucks. You can read my seven-part series on why Sparta is terrible on a collection of unmitigated pedantry. Sparta is definitely worse than you think it is and absolutely awful. Sparta is awful. <laughs> Tagline of this podcast, Sparta. It's Sparta. Awful. <laughs> it's awful. No, I have a huge beef against Sparta. I'm just... I, I have spent enough time around students having to sort of contrast what they think Sparta was like with what Sparta was actually like. And, uh, and eventually I got tired of it and wrote, you know, I think it's like 70,000 words on, um, on how the, the, just the Sparta of popular culture is, is relatively disconnected with the Sparta of reality. Usually because the 60 to 85% of people in Sparta that were brutalized slaves are just excised. Um, yeah. And I know if, if listeners are thinking, well, weren't most ancient societies like that? No. Um, you know, uh, the the sort of, obviously, ancient slavery all over the Mediterranean, like the percentage of, say, people in Roman Italy at the at its height that were enslaved is, is 15, 20, 25 percent. Um, Sparta sitting there at 75, 80 percent is wildly different. And recognized as different by people at, at the time. Um, there's, I think, an Aristotle quip that nowhere but in Sparta is the free man more free and the slave more a slave, which is a hell of a statement in a society that is 80-ish percent slave. Um, so Sparta is terrible, but that's not what we came to They can read. <laughs> but I do think we could talk about total war since that seems like it would be a fun. So you're an ancient military historian, but it primarily. Yep. Um, so Rome Total War or like the Total War series, what kinds of assumptions do you have to kind of undo for people who have played the games? And also, I guess, was it deliberate or did they just slap a fun ancient theme on some war stuff in a video game and it has consequences for the future? <laughs> Mostly that second thing. Um, you know, so the... Both Total War series, but the first more than the, both Rome Total Wars, but the first even more than the second, run into the problem that almost all video game content in the ancient world has, which is they play the hits. Um, which invariably means because history is really big, putting things next to each other that weren't. Um, and it says a really predictable result: Eastern cultures get exoticized, um, and Western cultures are made relatable. Um, which has is sort of awkward, right? This is straight up Orientalism. This is what this is. So Greece and Rome are made relatable and to feel more Western and their alien elements are smoothed over, whereas, um, or they're made badass. That's another option. Um, whereas Eastern societies are often made sort of aggressively alien in ways that, you know, Greece and Rome are not. And both Total War games indulge in this. Um, of course, most infamously, the decision in Rome Total War One to have Ptolemaic Egypt fight with an army appropriate for 1500 BC instead of 150 BC. Um, that 
in fact, the army of Ptolemaic Egypt should look very much like the army of Seleucid and the Antigonid dynasty in Macedon. They should be almost identical. And they're like, no, nah, these guys have like Bronze Age kopeshes and chariots. And it's like, that's not, that's a thousand years ago. Um, you know, this would be the equivalent of like a modern strategy game where like, you know, the United States has tanks and Russia has tanks and the French show up with mailed knights on horseback. Um, like that is the level of absurdity we're talking about. Um, and uh, it, it, the history of Egypt just generally, you don't need me to tell you this is long. I always comment to my students a reminder um, to give you a sense of how big ancient Egyptian history is for the listener. Um, the Great Pyramid was as old to Cleopatra as she is to us. She is the midpoint between us and the Great Pyramid. That's how enormous Egyptian history is. So picking something from Bronze Age Egypt and bringing it in to the like Roman period is that is huge. Um, that's not the only thing that they do to to exoticize foreign cultures. Um, you know, there's a lot in terms of how the religions are treated. There's a lot just in terms of the voice lines they're given, who gets wacky accents and who doesn't. Um, you notice the voice work, Carthaginians and Parthians get accents, but the Romans speak like they're from the Midwest. I'm like, you couldn't even, like, you could have hired Italians, um, right? That would have been interesting, hire Italians and Greeks. And like, no, the Greeks and the Romans have, like, they don't even have British accents. They have American accents. Um and um, this is actually something I've critiqued in a series I called The Queen's Latin, um, the tendency to familiarize and whitewash, uh, particularly Rome, um, though I was there, I was focused mostly on um, on TV and the tendency to to the sort of the tagline came after the fact that the Romans always speak um, uh, insular British English. Uh, everybody else has an accent, um, but like Roman senators speak the Queen's English or the Queen's Latin, as the case may be. But it's this sense that the the alien elements of Roman and Greek culture are sanded off, reducing the cultural distance, which of course reinforces this idea in the students that like Roman culture is us, but like Persian culture is them. Uh, which is not not justified. I, uh, at, you know, are there a lot of Roman holdovers in you know, quote Western culture? Yes, uh, there are actually a lot of Persian holdovers in Western culture too. Um, like, good Queen Bess the Second over there in England. That model of monarchy goes back to Persia. That's where it is through Alexander, through the Roman emperors, to good Queen Bess. That's the monarchy tradition that you're working with. Um, that is why she is also the head of the English Church. Um, you know, because this this idea of, of the the king has a religious role as well, right? This is part of Persian kingship, which is in turn an extension of Mesopotamian kingship, right? They're just picking this up. It's an available sort of of option. Um, I like to point out to students our tradition of sculpture comes from Egypt. Um, I, you know, you, you could do a wonderful slide of, you know, um, uh, uh, New Kingdom sculpture, late period sculpture, early Greek sculpture, late Greek sculpture, Roman sculpture, Renaissance sculpture, and you can just see the line of development. And so this idea that, oh yeah, and also the world's largest religion is this weird mystery cult from the Levant. I feel like we maybe need to tag that. Um, we you know, there's a sort of, but by sanding off the edges, right, the Romans feel like us and the Carthaginians feel like them. And, and in some ways I, I sort of push back against that. You, you want to try and, and certainly when you're teaching these cultures, you want to try and foreground some of the alien elements of, of Greek and Roman culture. Um, certainly there are similarities and connections between say the United States today and, and Rome. Uh, but there are also ways in which, you know, you would not feel at home in ancient Rome. You would be weirded out by elements of their culture. Um, 
And, you know, I mean, obviously the hierarchy, slavery, the strong, strong social hierarchy, um, you know, Roman social hierarchy is, is, you know, patronage systems and everything. Every man has a place, every man in his place. Social mobility by modern standards is extremely low. But then also, I mean, when you think about the way that religion influences public life, um, no total war game yet has made me sacrifice a goat before going into battle. And, uh, you know, I think that would be a useful thing to do to like, all right, you're about to charge. You've got to hit the kill goat button. Check the I mean, entrails. I'm here for that. This is what we do. Um, <laughs> I guess technically the, the killing the goat would be, um, would be Greek for the Romans. We've got to check some sacred chickens. Um, unless you're, yes, right. do not get mad and throw them in the water. Don't do it. Do not, do not throw the sacred chickens in the water. Um, <laughs> and so, um, but some, um, but these sort of alien elements are sort of sanded away, and the culture is sort of presented as very familiar. And no, it, it's not. Um, you know, 100 BC was a long time ago. True story. So this leads me to one more kind of big question, which is: so we discovered by talking in you know through your blog and in your work that you can absolutely teach things about history through board games, whether I mean or video games in this case whether or not those things are true so i guess the mm -hmm. question is could or should historians be deliberately trying to teach things through video games and what would that look like uh i actually have some colleagues in the field who do um who do courses on sort of history through games where it's a mix of sort of learning about and analysis and playing um and certainly uh, you know, as a military historian, I have my other foot in in that, and um, you know, in in we call PME um, uh, professional military education um, for for uh, military officers. War gaming and historical war gaming is taken very seriously as a way to develop the modes of thinking and and training. Um, I, I think you absolutely can use use games, either simple ones or complex ones, in in teaching environments. Um, it's especially helpful if you want to get students to think through a problem. Um, I've actually expressed that I really wish there was a simplified, stripped down educational version of EU four that you could like play through in maybe a couple hours because it would be an amazing teacher for interstate anarchy theory. Um, you know, you can you can use it to simulate things. You know, uh, household economies in the ancient world to get students to think through the the, the subsistence questions and and things like this. Um, so it absolutely can be a really valuable teaching tool. Obviously, you have to use it with some care. Um, the tricky thing, of course, is always is finding the time and a syllabus for it. Um, but it can be really useful, and of course, it's exciting and engaging to students. It gets them involved. Um, in a way, in a way that it, it it might not. So, I mean, you definitely can, and obviously the the big advantage for uh, you know board games here is 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 the relative ease of production and and setup. Um, you know, you don't need to know how to code or mod to produce it. Fair enough. So, if you're going to give us one homework assignment, a game to go and play that would be both fun and historically interesting, what do you recommend? Mm, mm, that's a tricky question. Uh, <laughs> probably, probably either EU four or Crusader Kings three, which is their their medieval game. I mean, play it with an open mind. Think about what are these mechanics trying to make me do. Uh, we haven't talked much about Crusader Kings, but I think part of the brilliance of it is it also rejects that state model that EU four has. In Crusader Kings, you really do play as a person. You kind of play as a family, but at any given moment, you were in control of one person. Um, and it expresses quite well, I think, the way that not all medieval governance by any means, but in the system, in the areas it's focused on, which is mostly Western Europe and to a lesser degree, the Islamic world, rulership was very personal. Um, and it was built out of personal relationships um, rather than impersonal institutions. Um, it expresses that system very well and some of the the sort of complications in it very, very well. Um, and so I think that that 
that would probably be sort of my go-to. But again, kind of play with uh, with a notepad um, uh, if if you're going to, and in, in terms of in terms of thinking, like, what is this game trying to tell me, and why? Excellent. I, actually, Crusader Kings is on my list, so now it's going to go further up the list. And then, uh, where can we find you online if we want to read your work, ask you questions, tweet at you? Uh, what are your basic social medias? And these will be in the the show notes as well. Right. So um, I am on Twitter at Brett Devereaux. I have a weird enough name that I got my name only one T on Brett. Um, I am also I've got my my blog, a collection of unmitigated pedantry. Um, that's acoup dot blog, or you can just Google for it. You'll find it. Once again, I'm weird enough that I'm not hard to find. Um, and I generally use my Twitter to announce if I'm on podcasts or doing this, that, or the other thing. Um, I lack the uh, uh, technical skill to set up my own podcast. Also the time. Um, <laughs> I can help you with the technical part. It's, it's, actually, <laughs> it's a lot better than you think. <laughs> but uh, I can be found anywhere online as Beyond a Solitaire, which hopefully you'll know if you're listening to this. But uh, thank you, Brett, so much for coming on and talking to us about video games. It's a bit of a departure for this channel, but I am here for it. Thanks for having me. It was great. Thanks so much, everybody out there who is listening. Please like, subscribe, comment, ask questions, and most of all, happy gaming.